More than half the Lok Sabha election is over. It's the fag end of the Lok Sabha elections. And joining us today is a very special guest, Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman, who's been very difficult to pin down because she's been very uh, busy campaigning. But ma'am, like I said, because nearly, we're nearing the end now, two more phases to go as far as the Lok Sabha elections are concerned. Five phases down. Where do you see the BJP and the NDA, especially because it set itself a very ambitious target as it started out? Comfortably, the Prime Minister is forming the third term government. We are coming back. And the bus in the ground, each phase as it happens, has been that people want stable government. They want certainty in governance. And they've seen 10 years of what Prime Minister Modi has delivered. So over and above all the political discourse, narrative, uh, banter which is going on, people are clear. And you see that in the turnout of number of women, the young. They've always been this, uh, particularly in the first three phases, uh, this narrative about voter turnout not being really very high. Despite that, if you look at the people who have come early to cast their vote, in long queues you see women waiting. Women have also articulated that they have received the schemes and the benefits of the schemes. They are the ones who normally go by not just the promises, they go by the delivery of schemes. So you think that the Mahila vote, as it said, is going to have a major impact in the BJP's fortunes because you spoke about schemes. Similar schemes are available in states that various opposition parties, be it the Trinamool in West Bengal or be it the YSRCP government in Andhra Pradesh, they've rolled out as well women-centric schemes. So you believe that the central schemes are going to somehow overpower those schemes? Um, only because, if you think about it a bit logically, at the state level, if it is a state election, people do know to differentiate between a national party which is not in ruling in a state, but a, na a state party which is delivered in the state. Whereas when they are looking at a central government and the election for the Lok Sabha, people do differentiate between what is being delivered by a national party as different from what is being delivered in some states by parties which are claimants from the opposition. So people are making that dist distinction, there is just no doubt. Um, you also spoke about stable government. So taking off uh, that, you know, recently the Home Minister in an interview spoke about how stable governments positively impact the stock market. He spoke about buy your shares, they're going to jump after June 4th. The Congress says this is fear-mongering, this is inciting the stock markets. How do you respond to that? Well, the Congress is now trying to take every argument with a twist. If you, I did see that uh, question and answer session where the Home Minister did give that reply. But uh, you can very clearly see that it wasn't response to uh, the fluctuations in the stock market and uh, based on which the uh, question was asked and for which the Home Minister gave a reply. It wasn't as if he was on his own trying to, you know, make a, a taunting argument saying, oh, you be ready with buying in the stock market. No, it was in response to a question. Now, just because there is going to be an opposition which is waiting to twist it, he can't just sort of, uh, you know, uh, not answer that question or give an ambiguous answer. Some banter does happen during such question and answer with the media. One, but however, what he said has a point, and that is people investing in the country, even if it is domestic, because today the Indian retail investor has made his presence felt in the stock market. And that is why even if there are outflows of FPI or to an extent even of the FDI, whether it happened in 2023 or it is happening now, the Indian stock market is not really violently uh, going up and down because the cushion is being offered by the domestic retail investors. And that cushion is what made Indian stock markets far more attractive than many other markets which are volatile. Given that situation, I would want to say that Indian investors who were just saving, saving in the banks or in fixed deposits, 
have found it comfortable to go into the stock markets because the returns are good. But returns are good because there is a stable government, stable policy, certainty which prevails in administration and so on. So it is indicative of that uh, policy certainty. There are no flip-flops. Um, uh, how do you respond to the charge that Rahul Gandhi has been making through this entire campaign that this government favors only 22 industrialists who seem to possess uh, the wealth of 50% uh, of the wealth and uh, the rest of the 50% is with 70 crore Indian citizens? So the, there's crony capitalism, the argument that he's been making. Um, I don't want to put the blame on advisors to Rahul Gandhi. But I think he's picking up on those extreme left-wing arguments which some of his advisors may be putting to him. It seems very, very provocative. It sort of, sort of uh, immediately raises the temper. And therefore, it is very attractive for a political campaign. But who is talking about crony capitalism, pray? The Congress? Rahul Gandhi? If he only looks back at not go as far as, uh, uh, as far back as Nehru, just go as far back as his own grandmother and his father. Crony capitalism unabashed was the hallmark of Mrs. Ganga Gandhi and was the hallmark of Rajiv Gandhi as well. Now, so you just can't uh, carry those tales here and say crony capitalism. Now, Rahul Gandhi has been trying this game since 2014-15, peaked in 2018-19, he had to go to the Supreme Court and apologize. He is very good at talking like this without any proof in his hand. So, I'm sorry, responding and giving credibility to even an allegation that he might want to make is just not happening. He's been talking about unemployment, inflation and bhagidari is what he says. He says that uh, there will be a financial and economic survey if the India bloc were to come to power after these elections where Dalits, tribals, minorities, even the poor among the general category will have a sense of what their bhagidari is. How do you respond to that? If only he's done his homework on the Dalits, on the uh, tribes, I would like to say more can be done. But both from the point of view of Samman giving and from actual benefits reaching them, you can take examples after examples. If the tribals in this country have received that kind of due respect, I'm not saying it's a favor that we have to do, due respect for the role in the freedom movement, for the role that they are uh, under, undertaking in, the, uh, in their areas, for the contribution from the minor for the forest produce and so on, and the way in which specific programs for the particularly vulnerable tribal groups, Prime Minister Modi has initiated, and to treat um, Adivasi Saman uh, Divas, uh, Bursa Munda's, Bhagwan Bursa Munda's uh, birthday being treated as uh, Saman Divas for the tribes, and also treating next year, 2025, as year of the Adivasi Saman. These are not things which have happened during Congress's time. It's happening now. If anything, the District Mineral Fund, which became a part of the Mineral uh, Act in 2015, has actually given money back to the uh, districts where tribes live and where endowments are rich and where from many of the minerals are being extracted. Today, those district funds are getting their due funds and that is much useful in developing the tribal areas. Who brought this spring? Not the Congress party. And for the Dalit, I, I will again go to remind who was talking about Dalit Saman. Look at the shabby way in which Congress treated Dr. Ambedkar. They defeated him in an election. They didn't even think worthy of giving Bharat Ratna for uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Look at the punch thief. The five places which are very, very sacredly attached to Dr. Ambedkar. We have, this government has, Prime Minister has, made sure those places are obtained, given the due uh, necessary resources, and brought it to be 
a national monument in each of them, one even abroad, when he was in the LSE. These are not things which have happened uh, under Congress. Clearly, it has happened in the last 10 years. Ma'am, but the charge about polarizing the electorate, uh, that, you know, the BJP is not speaking about real issues, but is doing hindu Musliman. Today, the Election Commission also said that some star campaigners of the Bharatiya Janata Party may have been indulging in that sort of rhetoric, and it should refrain. The party should refrain from that kind of communal rhetoric. Yes, but uh, I would like to say this is communal rhetor uh, ret uh, rhetoric if it is BJP. What happens when the Prime Minister of the country says the first right over India's exchequer is on the Muslims, it should go to the Muslims? Is that not polarizing? Is that on the basis of which religion, on the basis of which you want to give the resources? Is that allowed by the constitution? But that and hasn't been said in this campaign now. No, no. You may want to now say that has not been said in this campaign and therefore it is not part of the campaign. Very convenient. But what has been said in the manifesto? One point here, one point there, another point somewhere else. Is that not rhetoric? Is that not campaign polarizing rhetoric? When Raj Rahul Gandhi says, I'll do an x-ray and I'll make sure that the resources which are with the people will all be accounted for and I'll redistribute them. And together with that, when Lalu Prasad Yadavji from Bihar, part of the Indi Alliance, says, yes, there should be reservation for Muslims. These are none of them accounted as polarizing rhetoric during election. It happened during this election, ma'am. It's all coming out of the fountainhead that is Congress's ideological commitment, which is appeasement of its vote bank. That's not communal. I'm just shifting focus uh, from the Congress party to the Ahmadmi party. You recently held a press conference as well. Uh, Swati Maliwal, a member of parliament from the Ahmadmi party, has leveled some very great charges against the chief minister's uh, aid. The Ahmadmi party is saying that Swati Maliwal is a pawn in the BJP's hands. Amazing how, instead of answering whether there was an attack or not, Instead of saying why this lady had to go to the hospital for a physical checkup, instead of explaining as to why she was limping as she was going to the hospital, instead of saying even if whoever she was, her position today is Rajya Sabha MP Ahmadmi Party. As to why she needed to call the police station to uh, register a complaint late in the evening, saying I'm being attacked. Instead of answering any of this, and I'm surprised that the media and anyone else who are in support of this kind of a narrative is suddenly forgetting that it was an MP, a woman, who till recently headed the National State Commission for Women, who is now herself saying, I've been thrashed by no less than the uh, personal assistant of the chief minister in chief minister's house, even as the chief minister was at home. Hurry, how grave is this? We are not bothered about any of that. But what do we want to answer and what do we, and that too, what do you want BJP to answer? He is now saying it, she's a BJP mole. Hurry, go into the gravity of that issue. You've let that go. And you're now saying, no, no, uh, CM uh, Kejriwal is saying she's a BJP. She's your MP. She, this happened in your house. If she was a BJP mole, why did you, you even give her a seat in the Rajya Sabha? And if she's a BJP mole, even if she's a BJP mole, she's not. And I would like to say this. You want to thrash them up? Pick them up, go honorably say she's a mole of the BJP. She entered my house without my authority. I want the police to take action. Would you do that or you, you would beat them black and blue? What kind of a BJP mole was Chief Secretary of Delhi? Why did you have to thrash him up again in your house with your presence? This is a complete hooligan gang which does things brazenly, violative of the prom, uh, oath that you've taken. You're not keeping up the safety of women, safety of bureaucrats who are serving the country. In fact, and instead of protecting them, you misbehave with them. And then look at the enthusiasm with which media goes about asking, oh, now they are saying she's a BJP mole. And so you would want to beat them? Beat her? She's not one. She's your MP. 
It is your house. It's your PA. And you were still in the house. You thrashed her. Tell me why? Not a word on that. I would request the media to ask him on all these specific points rather than carry this frivolous twisting of the tail. Um, thank you so much for speaking to India today. That was the Union Finance Minister speaking on a whole host of issues that have dominated the election rhetoric this Lok Sabha campaign.